What I know partially is that the Ottomans achieved this diversity and plurality uh, system actually based on um, a very careful study of traditional Hanafi fiqh. I'm at an age and time of my life that I cannot hide these things anymore for po being politically correct. iPhone has already entered in the subconscious of that young man and he thinks he's resisting the modernity by Shalwar and Kavis. What a naive view of the world. Perdeler, perdeler, her yerdeler, asıl perde yürekte, neredeler, neredeler. My name is Bülent Şenay. This is a Turkish name, but uh, my first name Bülent actually comes from Farsi, Persian, and um, most likely in Urdu as well. It's called Bülent. Um, I'm currently a professor of comparative religion in a Turkish university in the Faculty of Islamic Studies and Ilahiyat. Well, there is, a, there is an Ottoman historian called Naima in the 17th century. He wrote a history of humanity and Ottoman Empire, and this book is uh, available. This, this uh, uh, masterpiece is available today. In the introduction to this book, he has a description of and definition of uh, tarikh, history, the role of history in human understanding. And he has wonderful phrases there. <laughs> Um, in the Ottoman language, which is a combination of Arabic and Central Asian Turkish. Uh, allow me to quote this directly from the Ottoman language, and then I will try to translate it. <clears throat> History Gaibi shahitten kıyas olmayanı mevcuttan iktibastır. The keywords you may have been familiar Gaibi şahitten kıyas olmayanı mevcuttan iktibas. History reading, he says, um, provides the reader a capacity of uh, uh, distinguishing uh, what has happened and what will happen, what might happen. And uh, the, uh, he, it gives to the reader the ability to derive what might be coming from what already happened, right? Zayib, Shahid, uh, etc. I think this is the short answer. Um, what is important for uh, the readers is that you don't get lost um, um, between the horses and, you know, arrivals and the armies and the wars and battles. Look into the cultural dimension, the transfer of culture transfer of knowledge. Knowledge travels. Uh, we don't sometimes think about it. Knowledge travels, culture travels, and history of reading might help us to capture that which provides us with a context when we look at things today. When it comes to comparative religion, Comparative religion, again, is a high-level study. <coughs> Unless you teach and stable the students in uh, these schools uh, on basic issues of deen, aqidah and, you know, fiqh, kalam and all these things, uh, they should not study compar comparative religion. Comparative religion should come at the end with philosophy. So these are the, the philosophy and study of philosophy and social sciences should come at the to, towards the end of the uh, the whole study as bottle opener, vision openers, and comparative religion is very is a very Islamic studies, I would say. Our traditional ulama always studied other religions, always referred to because the Quran refers to Ahl al-Kitab, Jews and Christians and 
you know, Sabines and Zoroastrians, etc. So this created a curiosity in the ulama, traditional ulama, and Shahristani uh, wrote Al Milal wa Nihal, Ibn Nadim wrote Kitab al Faris, and all others, even, even Imam Maturidi in the field of Aqidah, in his book Kitab al Tawheed, he has significant chapters on Christian mazhabs. People forget this. Why? Because his concern is not Christianity or even Islam, his concern is Tawheed. Right? Of course, Islam is Tawheed. So he deals with these Christian um, denominations that existed in his time, in his society. And he referred to them, he refuted them, he criticized them, but he knew about them. This is the point I want to underline. Yeah? Imam Ghazali knew about them, Ibn Hazm knew about the Christians and Jews in Andalusia. Um, our ulama knew about them. They studied, um, they studied the Bible, and you know this is a part of the ilm. Because ilm um, is a is is a is a human enterprise. Huh? When when something is human enterprise, you should uh, have it as large as possible, as interdisciplinary as possible. Two things. First of all, as far as I understand, what you are refer referring to as the peak uh, centuries of Islam, civ Islamic civilization, that is roughly from the, uh, I would say, 7th, 8th century till, let's say, 14th century. You can include the Ottomans to that too, but there is this tendency of Western classification stopping around 14th century and they don't like seeing the Ottomans that's a Western Orientalist presentation of history because uh, it's related to looking at the Islamic studies is Islamic history as Arab history they don't want to see it as an Islamic history this is a very crucial thing so the first thing is that this period uh, approach to knowledge was holistic not compartmentalized so uh, the studies uh, uh, included various aspects of that that issue. So the, the then ulama and and students, the scholars and students, uh, they were taught this multi-layered, multi-dimensional knowledge. In what we call the then madrasas, they studied the cosmology um, and 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 mantuk, logic and other things, and then moved on specialist areas like tub medicine and other areas. This is, a, this is the first thing, I would say, holistic approach, which doesn't exist today. The modern study of anything is compartmentalized. So you don't get knowledge, but you get information. Knowledge, ma'rifa, information is ma'lumat. I like the young people to understand that. There's a different. So many young people have ma'lumat. Oh, I, I read in this book this, had this, and this, this. So what is the question? What do you make out of it? So um, ma'lumat, namely information, is not equal to knowledge. That is uh, ma'rifa. So holistic studies provided knowledge. And the books of the of those centuries were this kind of books. Um, the second thing <clears throat> that I believe um, provided um, uh, Islam this um, opening uh, is the very diversity of the Islamic aqidah, or or the place of diversity in the Islamic doctrine. What do I mean by that? And therefore, the society, you know, Muslim societies, the then, more diverse, more pluralistic than today. Because there were no nation states at the time. These were like endless lands and there's no passport, there's no, you're not talking about passports, national borders, custom check. You know, these were like empires, small states, princehoods, and this and that. So we should keep in, in mind when we try to understand who is going where. Right? <clears throat> That's why Futuhat of Muslim armies were not necessarily always attacking another country. There was no country as such, let's say. This is another subject to discuss. 
But going back to the diversity issue, <clears throat> the very Quran, in its claim to be the ultimate truth, Islam, at the same time says, well, in this world, everyone is free. Everyone is free. No hesitation on this. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً جَعَلَ النَّاسِ If Allah had willed, He would have made the whole humanity a single, similar, single, one type of community. He didn't. In another way, He says, لَا يَزَالُنَ مُخْتَلَفِينَ They will continue differing. <clears throat> this Quranic view of plurality, supported by many other ayat in Surah Al-Hajj, uh, verse 39, where there is mention of can you believe in a scripture which claims to be the final book there's reference to did you know that there's reference to literally church synagogues huh? monasteries did you know that you know sawami wabiya wa salawat wa masajid in which scripture of in the world there is reference to the other with such confidence and in that ayah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if we didn't send our good people, meaning Muslims, all these uh, worship places would have been um, uh, huddimat, you know, would have been destroyed. Meaning, by Mafum Mukhalif, that Muslims are responsible with protecting other people's uh, religious freedom. You can look at the Surah Al Mumtahina, verse 7, 8, 9, along the same lines. The criteria between Muslims uh, and the non-Muslims in the global sense of relationships between the Muslims and non-Muslims is not religion and ethnicity in the Quran. The fact that the Quran uses kafir, munafiq, mushrik, all this terminology is related to the um, akhirah state of these people. In this world, the criteria is justice and zulm, dichotomy, right? Adala and qist. So if they are zalim towards you, then they are not for your friends. Huh? So when the, the, the verses in the Quran which refer to that, be careful with being friends with the non Muslims, is not about don't be friends with Christians or Jews. At the end of each ayah as such, <clears throat> there, are, there is almost a reason given. Because they are friends, they become friends with each other against you, etc. There are these kind of, you know, uh, friends, uh, uh, reasons, illa, uh, given at the end of the ayah. It's a long subject. In the Surah Al-Muntahina, uh, just like that, it says, um, إن الله لا ينهاكم عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصتوا لهم finished right and the the context is that in the previous ayat is that there is a conflict between Muslims and non-Muslims the infidels but Allah says أسا says the ayah in the surah in the ayah seven of the Surah Mumtahina, that it's hope that Allah will give mawadda between you and those adaytum minhum, those who are enemies with you. And then continues with the ayah that I just quoted. If they don't fight with you or declare war with you in terms of changing your religion or oppressing you in matters of religion, and if they don't expel you from your watan, home country, then Allah does not prevent you from doing two things being good to them, helping them, tabarruhum, وَتُقْسِتُوا لَيْهِمْ and be just to them. So the red lines are about peace and war. So Islam invites to peace. If you have peace, then your friends, contractual relationship. Allah will sort out your infidelity or your disbelief, not the Muslims. There is no legitimation of doing war, declaring war to make people Muslim. It goes the very core of the Aqidah of Islam, which is well known by the ulama anyway. And there is no serious well-known battle in the Muslim history anyway to convert people. You know, 
as much as I know. So what I was trying to say that the second print reason why uh, Islam went up to peak and now why we're not. Uh, the second uh, point was diversity. Imam Azam, Imam Shafi, Imam Ghazali, and all uh, the respectable uh, Imams and ulama that we keep referring to today, you know what? They wrote in cosmopolitan cities. You know, the Tus in Harasan, Kufa, Baghdad, Damascus at the time. These were um, cities, um, Cordoba, Cordoba Kurtuba uh, in, in Andalusia, all these cities or whatever you can add, uh, Cairo at the time, these cities were multi-religious, to the surprise of all the moderns, they were incredibly multi-religious pluralistic societies. Imam Azam lived with the uh, Nasara, there were Nasara around in the Arabian Peninsula, there were monks living around protected by the Aman given by the Prophet ﷺ to them in St. Katarina Monastery in the Sinai of Egypt today. I saw it, I visited the monastery. Um, there's so much, so many, there are so many examples of that. So for example, one of the two famous students of Imam Azam, who is he? Imam Yusuf, Imam Muhammad. What is the most famous book? Probably the only book by Imam Yusuf. Kitabul Haraj. What is it about? Taxes for non-Muslims. It was their duty to settle things peacefully, to help the Christians to pay the right tax from the Islamic perspective. So it was something very natural. <clears throat> Same thing with Imam Ghazali. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Muslim cities at the peak period of that Islamic civilization, as you named it, were pluralistic societies. Today we forget this. Today Muslim societies are not pluralistic societies. They are nation states, post-colonial countries with all sorts of problems that, that remained from the colonial heritage um, except Turkey and Iran and partially Pakistan. But Pakistan, at least the population, the people come from the British colonization, the experience of the British colonization, but nevertheless an independent state and it carries all the you know ramifications of that history and, and heritage and we know what's happening these days in Pakistan all this debate about extremism etc at the time of the Islamic the peak of the Islamic uh, civilization churches were free synagogues were free huh? it was something very natural as long as nobody uh, stepped anybody's nerve and that was not an issue of religion it was an issue of public order I think this can tell something uh, to us about the past and today. I'm not a specialist on the Ottoman history, but as, as someone who is interested in the history of ideas and thoughts and religions, what I know partially is that the Ottomans achieved this diversity and plurality uh, system actually based on um, a very careful study of traditional Hanafi fiqh and the Maturidid uh, Aqidah. But the magic is not with the Hanafi fiqh or the Maturidid Aqidah because there are groups who claim to be Hanafi but they are the most extremist groups. right? So the magic is not with being Hanafi or Shafi. Indeed there are some differences but they are not to the extent of like absolute criteria. <clears throat> the Ottoman Empire was an, uh, was an empire uh, uh, that was based on advancing uh, in geography. So moving on and conquering places where local population voluntarily most of the time accepted their rule over the Byzantine Zulum. Their own Orthodox Christian Byzantine uh, emperors and kings were not so just. Many uh, non-Muslim historians uh, also, um, you know, uh, witness to that. Uh, they refer to this reality. So, the Ottoman advance in the geography 
uh, which is <clears throat> from the Seljukites to the Ottomans and is partially you were watching it in the Arturul, Arturul uh, series. Of course, partially it's a fiction. It's not a totally a documentary. But a significant part of it is based on, uh, you know, consultation with the historians, as far as I know. So the Ottomans utilized the fukah, the Hanafi fukah, and developed a secular law and Sharia law together. It's called Urfi uh, uh, and Shari law together. So the Urf, the local custom, was important, which is based on Hanafi fukah anyway. So Ma'roof is like Mashru'. Right? Whatever is Ma'roof, it's also Mashru'a at the same time. It's like ordered by the Sharia. Unless it's openly against the basic tenets of Islam. I think the specialists about the Ottoman history, they underline this, the uh, ability of the Ottomans developing Islamic law in peace with secular law. And the other religious and ethnic minorities also, they were free in their internal affairs anyway, based on what is called millet system. It's called millet system. Millet meant individual religious communities, which comes from Millet Ibrahim Hanifa. It's a Quranic term used by the Ottomans in the official records. Non-Muslim communities were protected, not tolerated only. They were protected, and in these fermans and amannama, as they were called it, the language was like anyone who touched the, the, let's say, the apple of the eye of this Nasrani monk will find my sword, the sword of the 124,000 prophets and the sword of the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their neck. Uh, can, you, can you see this way of looking at it? This is nothing to do with the modern Western idea of toleration. Right? You cannot even look, uh, you know, harassing them. All the imannamas are full of evidences like this. So, I think in short, this much I can uh, say. Um, Islamic libas is any libas in any culture uh, which uh, take care of cleanliness, humility, modesty, uh, keeps away transparency, you know, uh, not tight, it should be lo sensibly loose. This is Islamic dress. There is no other Islamic dress. Um, the current endless <coughs> debate among Muslims about jalabiya, shalwar kameez and jubba and all these things are useless, waste of time. If the Prophet I'm so convinced at this age after so many years of studying Islam and I'm telling this by looking at the eyes of young people with no hesitation, they cannot bring me any single evidence that this is Sunnah that all these things <clears throat> um, keep Muslims stuck with petty and trivial issues. Let me give you an example, a quick example. We can come up with hadith and, uh, as well. But when, let's say, the Nabi Wasallam became Prophet, Nabi, he was chosen, he was uh, informed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was chosen, what was he wearing? He was wearing Jalabiya. So before he became prophet, he was wearing Jalabiya of the local custom dress of the Arabia. <laughs> Did he change his clothing after he became prophet? No single source tell us this way. Abu Jahil, Abu Lahab, all the mushriks, they were wearing the same clothes. The only thing the Nabi Wasallam, or all the Sahaba who became Muslim, before that they became Muslim, they were wearing the same thing of the local custom, Jalabiya, Omar radiallahu an, Abu Bakr radiallahu an. When they became Muslim, alhamdulillah, they continued, it was a non-issue. The only thing the Nabi Wasallam, the, the few hadiths you can find about clothing are about cleanliness, humility, you know, 
and in relation to the context of the the then local custom. Even the <coughs> hadith about keeping the trousers above the ankle uh, <coughs> the nari type of hadith. It's because the mushriks, their clothes were you know, swiping the floor. Uh, they, they were wearing silk and extravagant clothes and wearing golds and things and the Prophet ﷺ was constructing a new identity. So he was not proposing a new clothes, new uniform or anything. He was preferring to personality threats. Yeah. And <clears throat> his advice on not having tight clothes, legitimate sunnah, uh, uh, warning against transparency, warning against uh, najasat, uh, in in terms of cleanliness. These are the qualities of um, Islamic clothing. Nothing else. The turban. Abu Jahl was wearing turban, subhanallah, and the Muslims were wearing turban because it was desert. You know, desert sand, wind, storm. You had to cover yourself. The only thing at the time you could have. What is this sunnah? We know in the same kutub sit that, that one day, I, I love this, <coughs> the jamaat was waiting for the zuhur, the noon prayer. Abu Bakr was in the front and the leading sahaba were in the front and they were worried because the Prophet didn't come in the usual time. He always used to come. They were worried, but they said, Abu Bakr, they always waited what Abu Bakr would do. Abu Bakr was calm, you know, and then at some point they saw the Prophet Sallam, that's what we love him for. He was walking fast, very calm, no turban on his head. He had long hair, according to the Shamai literature, and there was water dripping from his hair. And he went to the mihrab and led the prayer. SubhanAllah, can you imagine today? And the Imam Saab leading the prayer without any turban or takka or anything. This was a non issue. Islam, what makes Islam unique and final is its simplicity. <coughs> is its simplicity. Shalwar kameez. Hindus wear shalwar kameez. Huh? What is Islamic in shalwar kameez? If you wear a loose pair of jeans, a loose shirt, is it non-Islamic or loose suit? Let me finish, wrap this up. Uh, same thing with the beard and moustache thing as well. It's about, I mean, the idea that, which is absolutely true, man tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum, whoever looks like a, a culture, qawim, the word qawim needs to be elaborated there, uh, he is from them. He is among them. Here, tashabbu is not about likeness in clothes or appearance. It's about uh, what the ulama says, ta'assi, which comes from uswayi hasana. So if you take culture, uh, their culture, the non-Muslim culture, idealized and prefer over Islam, <coughs> that's what tashabbu is about. It's not about, like, look, look at the Naivety and what else? I don't know. Can I think I'm going to quote Al Maverdi for this? Um, all these shalwar kamis wearing young people have their Nike shoes underneath, you know, with uh, su incredible suspensions and their turbans, and in their hands is the iPhones of the kuffar, right? iPhone has already entered in the subconscious of that young man. And he thinks he's resisting the modernity by Shalwar and Kavis. What a naive view of the world. Huh? Google is made in Tel Aviv. Most chips are from Israel that uh, Shalwar Kamiz wearing, Jalabia wearing, young people are using in their Android phones, in their Jalabia pockets next to Misfak. Do you see my point? Look, I think the best summary is this was an issue throughout history, apparently. So ulama mentioned this. Imam Ghazali mentioned this. Other ulama mentioned this. One thing that I, one example that I like most, <coughs> is by Al Mawardi, 
He says in one of his writings, he says that Mukhalafatul Urf fi al-Libas and similar things is Hamaqatun. Excuse the language. He says literally stupidity. Going against the local custom in terms of the clothing is nothing but stupidity, he says. Nothing to do with Islam. I think that sums it up. The main message are, uh, to some extent, also related to our previous conversation. Many Muslims are miserable, at least they look miserable and frustrated. You come close to a mosque in many parts of the Muslim world and in Europe, in Britain, in, uh, you see people coming out of the Juma prayer, their faces are angry, tense, unhappy, you know, and an outsider would think, what's happening inside, you know? Was there a fight or something? <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, believe me. I'm at an age and time of my life that I cannot hide these things anymore for po being politically correct. Or just because some Muslims will like me or will not like me. <laughs> truth is happiness. So I'm going to speak the truth. <clears throat> so in the Quran, however, while Muslims are like this, and then, with, despite this miserableness and unhappiness that many Muslims have, which um, they transfer to their young generations, and that's why many young people leave Islam. Uh, if this is Islam, I don't need it, they say. Right? And uh, that corresponds to the Islamophobic <coughs> stereotypings as well by the outsiders. What is corresponding with the Islamophobic stereotyping? The internal for a culture of frustration and unhappiness. So it feeds in the stereotypes. <clears throat> Whereas the whole Quran ultimately um, encouraged to be happy in this world and in the hereafter. Many Muslims will find this strange because they don't have a good grasp of the Quran. They don't have a direct study of the Quran or Hadith. Um, for example, in one ayah, one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى We have not sent you this Qur'an to be miserable. Speaking to the Prophet وسلم, and in the Hadith literature it refers to that the Prophet وسلم, was trying to pray at night until he collapses almost. And it was the mercy of Allah talking to him, what are you doing? <laughs> Literally, what are you doing? وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى so it's not even only in this ayah. Another ayah, this is in um, this this ayah that I just recited is from the Surah Taha, the second ayah. And what I that what comes to my mind now is from um Surah Al Hud, the chapter Hud in the Quran, where it uh, two verses follow each other. The first one says uh, those who uh, are unhappy in this world they will be in Jahannam, Khalidina. Look at that, shakwa, the same word used in the other ayah is used in this ayah. So those who are frustrated and miserable, it's miserableness and frustration is related to kufr, a type of kufr. Who are you to be miserable in connection to religion and make others miserable, therefore? And the following ayah speaks about Allazina su'idu, sa'adat, the word sa'adat, is in the Quran and those who are who were made happy that means Allah makes us happy and they will go to Jannah have you ever seen have you ever, have we ever taught this to our young people yeah. we always have this distorted image of uh, dunya because it's funny it's temporary it's it's not important it's not valuable so you try to mess it up, you know, try to pass it as useless as possible, right? Which is against Sharia, which which is against the will of God. What does that say? Hmm? Look for the hereafter with what you have in this world, what you are we have been given by Allah in this world. It's a direct order. Right? Don't underestimate this world. La tensa nasibak. Nasib. So Allah gave nasib to you. Who are you to refuse it? Excuse me, it's like kufur. 
<coughs> so around these hadiths, um, around these ayat, the verses, there are some other ayat verses in the Quran, and some uh, sayings of the Prophet hadiths, which connect happiness and unhappiness debate to the very central issue for the Quran of extremism in religion. Again, Muslims are incredibly blind to these ayat. La taghlu fi dinikum. What do you mean? It's not an it's not an American Orientalist phrase uh, <coughs> or the British politicians' language. It's the Quran's language. <coughs> Don't <coughs> excuse me. Don't be extremist in religion, literally. Uh, and hadith. Ibn Majah, Ibn Hanbal, Ibn Hanbal's uh, Sunan Musnad is used by the so-called extremist Salafis. And that's where this hadith is. Ya ayyuhal nas, iyyakum wal ghulu fiddin. Stay away from extremism in religion because it did uh, destroy the communities before. Religion, religious extremism destroyed the previous communities. <laughs> Because some Islamophobes accuse Muslims for being extremist and relate them to, like the prevent law in in UK and in other European countries, you know, anti-terror associated, Muslims try to uh, disassociate themselves with this Quranic and Nabawi structure or, or warning about extremism. No. And extremism prevents happiness. And our history is full of discussion on happiness. Al Farabi speaks about how to attain happiness in the Tahsil Sa'adah, the attainment of happiness. Look at the famous Imam al Ghazali. We always like quoting Ihya al We don't want to see Kimya al Sa'adah, huh? chemistry of happiness, because we don't like being happy anyway. Huh? We, want, we like. You know, taqwa means miserableness. You know, um, so this has to change. This has to, this is the core argument. So I propose certain ways out and forward things. And Muslims should um, turn towards ecological awareness, um, rediscover the Islamic diversity, rediscover art in Islam. And first and foremost, Muslims should rediscover humor in Islam. Yeah. That's, that's connected to happiness. Bin Shavi and uh, Khudari, not Abdul Samit. <laughs> Hassan al Nadwi's uh, Book of Sira. That should be like giving my secrets out, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, wait a second. I should answer to that question. Um, um, okay, let's say Sultan Ahmed Köftecisi. It's not only one, but Wag the Dog, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman. It's about how uh, certain political powers cheat the whole world about fake politics. There are many, but the, the first thing that comes to my mind is by a contemporary who passed away in 1960s, 1970s, Najib Fazl Kısakrek's poetry. In Turkish, I will say, and try to translate it. Perdeler, perdeler, her yerdeler, asıl perde yürekte, neredeler, neredeler. Curtains, curtains, where are they? Real curtains are in the heart, where are they? Professor Sayyid Hussein Nasser, the heart of Islam. <coughs> Currently, I'm reading a book by... Uh, uh, I think the title is Secret Connections by Fritjof Capra.
I think I should go back to say to say Nasser. <clears throat> well, say to say Nasser, Ismail Raji Faruqi, and the third one, Sezai Karakoch, who whose literature writings are about how we can reestablish Islamic civilization. Imam Ghazali. To go countries that I have not been to. Traveling. Siru fil ard. A very short one, <coughs> which is very striking at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsinin. So be a muhsin person. Allah loves muhsins those who live their lives beautifully their iman beautifully that's what muhsin means so try to deserve that love from allah for being muhsin 